Well, now we're going to mount a bobcat laying on a limb, closed mouth. This is what we got. Now some of the main measurements you know, before you order your form, you go from eye to nose, I can go right inside the tear duct. Unfortunately, this guy is frozen. As you go inside the tear duct to the very end of the nose, first measurement. Other important measurements are right around the belly. Be as accurate as possible. It looks like about, oh, about 19 and 3 quarters inches. And you write that measurement down. Then you go the total length of the body, end of the nose. Right down that spine, right to where the base of the tail starts. Right at about 29 and a half inches. There's other measurements like neck measurements and stuff like that. But usually, if you get the eye to nose, total length, and the girth, you're pretty good. Sometimes you run into forms like a customer really wants a form. And if you're inch too big or inch too small or something, sometimes you can work around that. I have been known to take a little off the forms, you know, as long as it's relatively close. You know, if it's like two or three inches difference, be careful because your cat could end up looking long-legged and short-bodied. And it don't take much. Mother of nature is pretty perfect. So also you want to get a good tail measurement. So in this case, looks like three and three quarters. Get your tail measurements. Uh, at least before you skin it out, get your tail measurement. And as far as the eye to nose on the cat, as long as you're like within a quarter of an inch or so, like maybe the form, you know, if it was maybe a quarter inch less or something, but everything else matched up, you could probably get away with it. So, but you need to be pretty close on your measurements, and it's a lot less headache. There's nothing worse than trying to stretch an animal that don't want to fit. It's rough. Okay, when your bobcat arrives, a lot of times they'll be in two sections, and most of the time the head is going to not be connected. When you're trial fitting your mount, I just use a couple of T-pins to pin the head in, and I worry about gluing and all that stuff later. But your wire, you've got a wire in the tail, and that's where you get your measurement. Uh, you, you apply your measurement from the real cat and put it on the tail, maybe ever so slightly shorter to allow for the tapering of the very, very end of the tail, but pretty much like really, really close. A lot of times, not always, but some of these you can, like if you've got a lot of skin, well, you can dremel up in here and push some of that skin up in there, you know, to get rid of some of that loose skin. Just get a pair of bolt cutters on some of these other ones, and, Snip them off like that. You know, a good pair of bolt cutters, a good strong pair of pliers or something. Well, it can depend on uh, what pose it is, frankly. What's well, like with anything, a squirrel or anything, how he's going to be mounted can determine whether you lock a leg off, you know, where it's easier to mount. And a lot of times, while you're mounting it, you sometimes you figure that out. You just saw it off and glue it back on. Whatever you got to do to get him out. Now on this guy, it's got two wires coming out. It's a leaping cat. I figure the wire, the two wires there, they probably want you to cut one of them off. Possibly, or you could possibly even use both of them. But what you got to do, a lot of times you want to have him leaping up and trying to snag a bird or a quail or a pheasant or something. And these wires come in handy for that. Although the wires are there to kind of help with, you know, some durability of the form, they're also there to help you mount a bird or and put it on the like very end of his paw or something. You can order ready-made limbs like from your taxidermy supply company, and it all needs to be reflected in the price. You know how much you're charging your customer. You know you got to take all that in consideration. Luckily. I have an old log and limb that I've had for, oh gosh, four or five years at least. And the reason I had it, for a turkey. You know, to have a turkey, you know, gobbling on the limb. But it comes in handy for this bobcat. You can cover stuff up with moss and plants. Customer will never know. 
You could even put a panel back there. Have this bolted up against the panel, and it would look really great. But it just so happens, I didn't have it set up for a turkey, but it's set up perfect for a bobcat. Because there's like a, there's a durable stub on the back of this log. And it just, here's a good little brass hanger with an oversized hole. I go a little bit below me. Okay. Another screw. Grab my screws and do my. See if it hangs up. Perfect fit. We can put a big old panel in the back of it, a real pretty panel to make it look good, and put some plants all over it, all kinds of neat things. We may put a panel a little bit later. We just use T pins and pin the head in temporarily, just where it'll hold so we kind of, I kind of want the eyes level. And I know right now, that that's not really gonna be the case. I could choose to just put an angle on it, and maybe put a panel behind it, stick another wind, sticking out a little bit to kind of break the effect of it being out of balance. You could do it like that. Or I could. We're going to see what we can do to fix that up. Since it's wanting to turn on me, and then the weight of the bobcat's going to make it even worse, I'll put this behind it, try to center it good. And then I can adjust, you know, bolt this wood piece to this. I've already got my screw holes. Put it, I'm going to make this look real good. I'm going to put another coat of gloss on it and everything. Clean it off real good. Put another coat of gloss and it'll look fine. So I'm going to put this behind this. That way, you know, if it wants to do this, I'll put my hanger over here, you know, to kind of level the weight out. Where it don't want to do it. Now here's a little bit better view of it. You can order them from a uh, taxidermy supply company or you can, a local wood shop usually has all the stuff that you get from a supply company as far as wood and you're supporting your local economy. So a lot of times I try to go local if I can. Sometimes you can't, but they have real wood and it's not synthetic and of course you can get them from the supply company too, but a lot of times they're cheaper if you get them locally. I'm going to put him like this, maybe about right here. There's so much fur that, you know, you don't have to worry exactly how he lays, per se. And he'll be about like that. He's even, the camera may not be even, but he looks pretty even to me, just like that. So I'm going to go ahead and drill these holes. I went ahead and put the panel on sideways to give me some leeway where to put the weight. And after this cat's mounted, it's going to add more weight. I shot a screw in here to just to hold it in place. It's wanting to go this way, so I shot a screw into the door. I'm not going to alter the form any. I'm thinking along the lines of this. We may put another piece of wood or something under there just to kind of jimmy it up a little bit. And you get so many plants in there. So that's kind of what we got going on. I'm going to go ahead and drill the tool, the holes in the limb and then shoot some screws through it into the form so we'll have like a kind of a basis of how it's going to look and then we just got to wait on the cat to unthaw. Get a sharpie pen and kind of mark kind of like how I want him. Dot right there. Okay I may shoot a wire. I'm going to actually probably take a wire. Now a drill bit would even be better. There he is. There we are. Balance it later. Again. Well, you can't mistake red cedar, that's for sure. Well, here's what I got so far. In planning, I could have left the wire in here. It would have been great to secure the bobcat later. You know, to have left that wire in there somehow. But I went ahead and clipped them all. That's all right. We can even thread more wire back in there and, and run some wire. I've already got a hole under this foot that goes through this wood piece. And we can definitely secure that in, epoxy it or glue it or something and get it to stay. 
You got the rump back here where it's down. There's a little bit of a gap right here on this side of the neck. And it just so happens that's that's why I save old pieces of foam like from old deer forms and stuff. You know, like old deer forms, I'll I'll butcher them up or something if they're like really bad and old. And shave bird bodies and fish bodies and everything out of them. I like the head the way it is. And I know I gotta take that off later. I guess what I'm getting at is what it, what it is is I'm gonna glue pieces of foam, not on the head part. You know, just one side. And then I'm going to uh, wedge them in there and make it be part of the neck. Because I do have it kind of just a little bit, but not much more. Uh, you know, a little bit more twisted than what it was. But just a hair, just like maybe, oh gosh, three-eighths of an inch at its biggest spot. Put some foam in there. This is actually an old deer form. I'm going to put some foam in there, cut it down to size, and glue it on one side. And then later fill in the gaps with clay when we actually do the mounting. Well, that looks pretty good, though. So I went ahead and cut the excess off. Just with a knife, glued it on one side so it's actually part of the body, this foam that I inserted. And now I can take the head off. And before I mount it, you know, just smooth everything down with the clay. You know, any gaps like right there. And now, I can actually take the head off if I want to. And see, it's glued on. And everything's great. It's like part of the form now. Right here where the form was a little bit uneven. And you just either sand that off or even use your Dremel tool and just kind of grind it off real quick. It's just where two molds come together. Made the form. A little bit right there. A lot of times they they do a little bit of it. Come company. Like right here, see you see some flashing right there. That comes off. It can be smoothed out with sandpaper. There's a seam right up the back. Looks like they got that pretty good. We're going to, I'm just going to Dremel two holes with my Dremel tool right up there in the inside corner, right here and right there. And that's going to be good enough for me. And then I'm going to, of course, Dremel my mouth out all the way back to the corners there. Leave just a little bit more space back there for tucking. And maybe get some of this flashing off with sandpaper or even your Dremel tool can grind it down. <laughs> what I want to do is in there. I tried to be as careful with it. And I dremeled, you know, inside, the inside corner there for a little extra skin. You know, the transition area from the upper and lower lip. So right in there, or upper and lower jaw. And I just put two dr drill holes with about a, I guess a one eighth inch uh, Dremel. Just put my two holes. You know, used it to grind down some of this flashing a little bit. Also got sandpaper. And so we can use that sand and block stuff like that's real good for that. Now sometimes if you got a lot of loose skin you can dremel right in there and push it up in there. There's so much hair on a cat you can't tell anyway. Although in real life, you know, with a lot of your cats and stuff, they do have that loose skin that comes down and it don't really go in there much. But if you got a lot of loose skin, and it helps with proportioning the skin too to dremel up in there a little bit. And you got so much hair, it's not going to show much anyway. But I may Dremel right there. I may see how it fits first. And Dremel, like right for tucking, in other words. And I'll Dremel, like, probably right here, some maybe. Tuck some skin up into there. 
Now you don't want just a little bit of loose sloppy skin in other words. But I come in here and probably go up in here a little bit. And yeah, like right here. And then you gotta do it on this other side too, a little bit right there. Like right in here or something. And this is exit, you know, if you got a lot of loose skin, that's a good place for it. Okay, I always use reference pictures because, uh, especially on deer, I mean, uh, on uh, on your critters like your bobcats and stuff, and see, they tell you a lot. <laughs> I've used this for the eyes before a lot. You can tell it's been painted around. Here's another good picture. And you can see how the, I don't know if you can see, but if you look real close, the pupils actually go in a little bit on top. So instead of straight up and down, if I did an open mouth, see this shows me how it goes in front? Shows me how all that goes. It's good reference pictures. Here's another good open mouth. See, it lets me know how the shape, how it goes. See those little black tufts of hair below the lower lip there, the way they go, the way the whiskers go. You can see the nostrils there, see they're black on the inside. And there's like a little faint brown line at the right above the nose. So all that's good information. The way the, the way the white goes around the eyes, the way all this meets up, all good information. You know, even the color of the nose, I've got that if I need it. Though this is a giant tiger, the eyes are the same. It's, it's a good reference for eyes, for cats. The way the white goes around, just like on a bobcat. See this fox? There's a, that's a good fox. And a good eye reference. Shows you a lot about the hair, the way the hair goes. Here's a side view. It shows me how the hair goes from the side. It's all important. And see how the black, the black little line of hair from the, from the upper eyelid, you see how that black, that black streak, so you can put, replicate all that. The ears, this is a good, good one, ear reference, like how to place the ears. You know, I take it out of the photo album so I can see it real good and see how the black goes and all that stuff. I use it all. I've got a good, uh, I think I'm going to use this one. You know, I've got plenty of reference pictures. But it's going to, I'm going to try to mimic with clay the eyelid and the general shape of the eye. First, I'm going to fill in the gaps. I'm going to use all that. And right in here, this is all going to be clay too. On, You know, I'm going to put a little bit of clay there. I'm generally, what I'm doing is I'm making the exact shape of this eye. Well, that's kind of what I got right now. I'm just going to let the clay air dry. Well, here's kind of what I've got. I think it's going to look okay. So, uh, well, here's what we got. This is kind of what it looks like. I kind of like it. A lot of times I'll put like lines, you know, with a straight edge. So when I put the head back on, I know exactly how it went before, you know, before it came off. Feel free to uh, seal the wood with a like sanding sealer or something, or stain or whatever you want to do with it. Take him off his little hanger here. I got him laying on flat on a table. As good as I can, he's still partially frozen. I'm still going to try to skin him out if I can. But it's been a few days now, and I don't want the extremities to start going bad while the middle of him still froze. And this is how you would lay him if you want to get your measurements. First thing I'm going to do is skin his mouth out. That's my first thing I want to do. I'm going to skin my mouth back, go back as far as I can. Then I'm going to 
make an incision right down the middle of the back. So I still need to turn him right back over again and, and, and skin his mouth out like you would a deer or anything, like a deer head or anything. I mean, I'll make my incision. I'll partially start skiing until I get one leg free. Then I'll hang him up because I do better hanging him up and skinning him out. But I'll free at least one leg. And then after I do that, then I'll hang him up and we'll skin him out the rest of the way. First thing I'm going to do is lay him over. You can tell he's still frozen. I hate that. Plenty thought out around here. It's just the... Oh yeah, he's fine. Sometimes I use this. You know what we skin with? Or a... Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, we're in good shape. Now right here, I'm going to start cutting right here in the front. I guess they right above the gum a little bit. I don't know if you can see it, but all this right here. My next one's an open mouth. I gotta do a bobcat open mouth. And I wanna save a lot of this for, you know, this lip for going around into the mouth. But this is gonna be a closed mouth. You'll get some nose cartilage way back in here. I worry first and foremost about making sure that you cut as close to the gum line as possible, even around the nose. You don't want to accidentally cut some of your nose cartilage off that you don't want to cut off. I got a good sharp X-Acto knife here. You know, just a good fleshing knife would probably work if you can get in there with it. Right here. Stay as close to the gum as possible. You just, it always works out that way. You never have to worry. You never have to worry about not having enough to tuck or anything. Yeah, I've done this right here. All the way down to the inside. On this side, the same thing. Went ahead and got most of that. Yeah, my next one's open mouth. If I was doing open mouth, I would be, I'd be doing this too. See how close I'm getting to the gums or to the teeth? I want to make sure I have enough skin to tuck and all that other good stuff.
and it'll dull your exacto knife blades out, out but small price to play. We'll get down so far with this and then we'll uh, turn it over and make an incision down the back using my fleshing knife. Just running my blade along that membrane. Just like a deer or anything, you get up here, you gotta cut through that nose cartilage. I'd rather cut too much and not enough. There we are. And we're on the bridge of the nose, the very tip top of the nose. Got to be careful there. That's a place where you can put a hole if you're not careful. I had to move the hair a little bit because the hair was laying over on one side. And if I if I didn't pay attention to that, my incision would have been off on one side. Main thing is you cut up from underneath. Just like you would a deer head or any other animal, you know. Go right along that spine.
Still frozen back here. We're gonna do the best we can. I'll stop just short of the tail and start working my way down. Super simple. You just see that white membrane there and then cut that membrane. My membrane separate. Just be careful, he's a thin skinned animal. He's not quite as thick as some of the others. Now the reason I made an incision down the back without even questioning it, they got so much hair that it's it's easy to hide that stuff. So that's kind of what I'm getting at there. The smaller the incision you can get away with, the better. But if it if you make it, it's not going to hurt. That's what I'm getting at. So now we're getting into that damage. I had some serious damage. Create some of the skin first and I'll release a leg. So I turned him around. As long as he can pull and see membrane, I'm gonna keep running my knife along it and And eventually get this leg through. Yeah, a lot of blood seeped in there. What I like to do, I like to at least free one leg. And it's starting. Just keep running along that membrane. Now 90% of the time, when I'm out these bobcats, it's always along the back, you know, as far as the incision. Good fluffy hair that it'll cover, it'll cover up not only the incision, but even gunshot blasts where the leg is totally annihilated. A lot of times if you have enough skin, you can pin it together or sew it.
and pinning it, meaning pinning it together on the form. And it, it doesn't show that much. What I'm getting at is they're pretty good about hiding damage the hair is. The key is you want to blow dry it, you know, right after you pin it or sew it, the incision is not going to show, especially if you blow dry it first, even before it dries. That ensures it's not going to show near as much. I guess you work the hair follicles out or something, and it just seems to help. Now you can stretch. See that membrane coming off? Now we get this one leg done, done it's going to make it easier to skin out because we'll just hang this one leg up. You know, buy a skinning gambrel or whatever you got. To me, I just got roped with a noose in it that'll cinch up around the foot or the leg. As far as my bird set up, a skinning gambrel comes in handy for that. You know, little hooks to hook into the carcass while you skin him out. But there again, I just got a little, uh, I got a little hook with a sharp point made out of, I think it's 10 gauge wire, and I've been hanging turkeys off of it and everything, you know, as far as skinning my birds out. See, I'm just running along the membrane here. See, I'm just using whatever's at my exposure to go ahead and Coyotes and some foxes from here on down I make a small incision because it gets so tight and the skin don't want to pull down. Although I think on some foxes I have actually got it where the skin would come down. But definitely on coyotes it gets too tight. What it is you'll make an incision from this, this little elbow here. Now this is for a coyote and a lot of times foxes I go ahead and do it if it's real tough. You just make an incision and sew it back up when you mount it. It's extra work, but it just comes with the territory. Same with the tails. On coyotes, they got those big long tails. And because they got those big long tails, I tend to make an incision down at the bottom of it. Here, sew it back up. Bobcats, I don't use clay along the tail because their hair fluffs up and it looks so natural anyway. But there again, like coyotes and foxes, you know, towards the base of the tail, uh, you know, where it, where it meets the body. You want to put clay there. You want to model it up at least a little bit. You know, fluff will take care of only so much. That's what I'm getting at. Just slowly going along, it is tighter. So you can definitely see why on a dog, uh, on a coyote. You know why you would have to make the incision from here down to here.
Forex helps you get a better grip sometimes. Now approaching that one side of the claw, you know, on the cat, they got that one side claw. Yeah, on, on the front legs, it's uh, you know, way up front. I was pronounced on the back legs. If you ever buy one of these, make sure if you buy it, it's skin out for taxidermy reasons. You get trappers that skin them out and they'll cut the feet off. Now, if they leave the feet on, that's better because you can always skin the feet out and still make a mount out of it. And getting down here to the bottom. And I still want to go as far as I can. I know I've got a lot of borax on here. But you're approaching, you get to that last knuckle. The last knuckle being this one right here. Like on a person, it'd be this one right here. You get to that knuckle, then it's it's okay to go ahead and Snip through it with a good pair of snips. Okay. Now you probably ought to be able to see this, but okay, there's the first knuckle on a person. It's this one, you know, the fist knuckle. Then here's the second knuckle. First knuckle, second knuckle. Let's keep on cutting down. There is some ligaments I tend to cut through towards the end down here. This is the last knuckle I think I'm talking about. Yeah, here's the claw right here. Now you find that last knuckle. You can be careful when you get too close and the claws will fall out. Yeah, so I think, yeah, oh, yeah. What you want to do is get this middle knuckle right here. I guess it'd be this one right here. And find where the joint is, and it just slides right on through so easy. You got to find that joint. Then I'll skin down a little bit more. Most you can leave on the carcass, the better off it is.
I'm still separating membrane even. Here's the Yes, the second knuckle on down. That's the one you want to get. The first knuckle would be, I guess, like right here. This is the one you cut at. This one right here. Although you got one right here on a bobcat, it's just all fingernail. Let the scissors find that cartilage for you. You might have to search around just a little. But when you find it, it just glides right through. At least for a second I did. There it is. Cut through it. Work on down to the next one. This is the second one on down. We have to flesh it out. Flesh it out at least until that knuckle exposes itself. Find that knuckle. Where are you at? Are you here somewhere? Yeah, a lot of times you just got to keep looking. Oh, there it is. There you go. Now we're going to hang him up. We're going to hang him up by this leg, right behind, right behind this elbow where it can cinch you down. And that's, that's how we do it. I'm going to let it cinch down right around the back of that leg. Got my hemostats. Or a tail separator that you order of a taxidermy catalog is better. But a lot of times I'll find I'm trying to do this to show you. Okay, I'll get this. And I've skipped down the tail partially, but I don't want to cut any of those membranes that strengthen the tail so it'll give me all the support I need. I lock it in maybe one or two clicks depending on where I gotta go. Put one finger there, one finger here, pull, there you go. Skin it out. There's tail is now hollow. You can see my butthole. Now skin this leg out just like that, except now since I'm doing it with gravity. And able to, you know, I can even pull it out to one side and the gravity wanting to bring it down is extra little leverage. So you get more leverage by letting it hang. You use the weight of the animal to actually help you skin the animal out. Run that knife along that membrane. You can be a little fast with it, but don't be so fast that you start putting holes in it. Side of the leg, we already went through all the origin, the testicles, and everything. And just like with a fish or anything, when you skin them out, you try to stay out of the stomach. And uh, very beneficial on a coyote. Uh, you know, these animals, they, they snake when you're fleshing them out. Right here, we went through pulling. You can, you know, within reason, certain areas of the body you can pull and get away with it. Oh, the skin in him, it can save you a little on. You know, a little on fleshing later. 
because they don't ain't got to deal with all that meat. Now keep working on down until you get to that knuckle. You'll see it on the side. It's this knuckle right here. On the human, it'd be right here. I've only got four, four fingers on the back. Or, I mean, on the back foot instead of five. Apologize, but the front has the five. On a person, it'd be these right here. This knuckle right there. You can see them. And then you just find the cartilage. When you find it, it just goes through like no, no problem whatsoever. Sometimes you can skin a little bit, get down to that membrane. You know, if you have trouble finding that next knuckle, probably mean you need skin just a hair bit more. Is it on down? So you want to leave some skin connected so your claw don't come out. That's what I'm getting at. Which it will be if you just snip right off here at this knuckle. Seems like slightly below the knuckle is where the cartilage is. Yeah, there it is. And then we go down to the next one. Right down slightly below that cartilage. Somewhere right in here. There it is. There you go. So that, I just went ahead and took him off, lifted him up, and let the rope loop around the hip. I'm going through his wound. Probably a good idea to see that too. You can see the hole. I'm leaving all skin that I can, you know, any viable skin. Pulling down and finding any skin that wants to give way. I'm running my knife right along at the tip of it. Just running the tip of my knife, watching all that white membrane separate, and then watch more come and get exposed. Here's the damage area again. So we've got the option to pull. If we leave a little meat on there, that's all right. You know, don't get too carried away trying to, you know, leave all the meat on the carcass. We're gonna flesh it anyway. It's gotta be fleshed, and it's frozen a little bit. I'd rather freeze it for a while and kill any kind of mites and ticks and stuff off of it. Before I start trying to flush him out. And when I mean freeze, I'm not 
not just for like a day. You know, three days and possibly even longer than that. So I'm pulling here and still releasing skin. Remember, we already, already skinned the mouth and the eye, uh, didn't skin the eyes out. But I've done this enough that I'm confident that I can uh, not cut to the eyes. I want to be careful, but I did skin the mouth out. Got a finger in here. Let's see if I can pull. Should be able to pull a little bit. And it can. Here's the forearm. She can pull within reason. There's a little, some kind of padding right here. Not sure what that is. It's very small. There's some kind of padding there. I think that's this part. So we're getting close to the claw right here, I think. Okay, went down as far as we can go. We don't want a claw to fall out. But what I'm getting at is we got a claw that's starting right here. So what we want to do is find that knuckle and slip right through it. There it is. That's this knuckle. Now we can kind of, this is that knuckle. Now we can kind of fling it sideways a little and keep on trimming down.
Vi pull in. And there again, there's these knuckles right here. That's where you trim on these. At least I would. You probably could get down to that last claw, but I've had good luck just going down to these. So these, that next claw is exposing itself. Actually, don't go much further than that, than the next claw. Simply for the fact I don't want the claws to fall out. Make sure this little padding got it down far enough. It's easy to cut between the fingers if you're not careful. So make sure you don't do that. That's what I've got so far. So you want to make sure you don't cut between the cut between the fingers. There's their skin there. Get down as far as you can, preserve it if you can take care of the rest. Here's the padding. Let that second knuckle expose itself. Once you see it and you can get your scissors under it, you're good enough. That's good enough. I can see the knuckles. You can actually expose them a little with your scissors too. When you okay, that's below it, right below. There it goes. It's the cartilage in between the joint is what you're cutting. That's what I'm getting at. Same with the next one. Right below it. Bam. So that's doing. Got them all. This is only one. So we got this one right here. Find that joint. There it is. They're all snipped. So there's some little bit of skin back here holding it. Or not skin, but uh, stuff connected to the skin, I should say. Try to leave it on the carcass. Bam. Pull on down and to the ear shortly looks like I'm doing this I think you can still get me on the camera but you just grab by whatever you got to the full extra skin down so you can do what you got to do sometimes you got to tug what seems to expose itself the most when you pull it's probably one reason I'm jumping around a little bit and he's still partially froze in places it doesn't help, but at least he's bug free. Now 
times where that ticks crawl on the floor. You know, ticks that will stay on when the hunter brings you the animal that still that ain't been dead long. After a while, they they get out. They get off the animal looking for another host. And you'd be surprised how many are on there that weren't on there that you didn't see were on there. And that's mainly deer and other animals. Even turkeys can have some strange critters on them. Not necessarily ticks or the other stuff. They get other weird stuff on them. So just keep that in mind. Okay, the lower neck is exposing itself here. The arm. In other words, I pull certain areas and white membrane shows. I'm letting it guide me on the path. I'd rather be slow at it and make sure nothing it gets ruined in the process and to be too quick at it. We get close to the foot, we get to that, there's a little padding right here. It's, it's this part right here before you get to the thumb claw. Close with the thumb claw. So I find that Wes, it's hard to see it right now. Here's what it is. Starting on the thumb claw. You can see it right here. I don't I don't really want to cut too much membrane. There it is right there. There's the claw. So the last cartilage should be right here. There it is. Now that's literally right next to the claw. Now be careful there. Coming on down to the these little knuckle things. I keep using my hand as a diagram to kind of help you. I just expose, uh, I think it's these knuckles right here. Well, it might be these. The last knuckle before you get to the claw. That'll work. Now we're getting where the ear canals are. Pretty much right in here, the base of this neck. So I'm just about ready to go ahead and start cutting for the ears. Go ahead and take advantage of it and of the freedom of having the, uh, the arms just, you know, skin out. I go ahead and Go ahead and bring some of this down. And once come down anyway, go ahead and bring your own down. You'll notice when you get around the ears, it kind of gets rid of the membrane. You don't want to come down much or as good. So what you what you got to do is kind of try to guess where the ear canal is and it's it's better to go ahead and cut a bunch of meat off it's, it's better to go ahead and cut a bunch of meat off with the skin yeah i can see where the ears are kind of folding right here so yeah definitely on the ear there you can see it that's the ear i 
but it doesn't bother me to go ahead and rake along that membrane anyway. Let me go down in there. The lower jaw's got a bunch. I remember all that. We already got that before we, we got the mouth before we even started uh, skinning everything else up. So keep that in mind. And just to be safe, I would go ahead and start cutting right here at the back of the base of the school. Make sure you get that ear canal. Plus, it's been a while for me. But you can actually. Where's that ear canal? There it is. See how small it is? Small ear canal. An ear canal. Now, see the ear's already made itself known. It's right here trying to separate. So now I just uh, keep going along the membrane. Can't go wrong there. The canal has already been cut. That's the ear. Go ahead and rake that membrane. There it goes. Right now I'm grabbing hold of the canal. Anything else that wants to come off with it, we'll sort that out later. Now here's the eye. Let's go ahead and get the other ear before we start on the eye. There's the air canal. I went to the air canal right here on this side. So now it's just a, the ear wants to already roll over. It's already independent. It, it's already gave you the hint where it's at. There again, you'd rather have too much than not enough. So you have a lot of meat with the ear, so what? At least you're going to have a good amount. The jaw has already exposed itself. Remember, we did a real good job fleshing him out, right? And on the eye, make sure you get all that eye there. I start right there around the, you know, the bone part, the eye orbit, I guess is the right word. You can feel where the eye starts. So it's right here. Oh, super close. Okay, so we got through both of the ears. I cut way back here around the base of the neck, you know, where the jaw and the neck meet. And I got that, the ear canals to show them, you know, I, I cut real deep. There's a lot of meat on there that we're not going to need, but so what? Okay, now we're to the eyes. And you can actually see that, I can feel it, where the, the, the bone around the eyes it shows. That's where I'm going to start cutting it. I do, I do it this way with coons and everything. Deer heads, they all skin the same way. I 
I can already see the eyeball. If I wanted that little thin skin that's over the eyeball, I go ahead and get it started. Kind of lets me know where I'm at. So I can already see what needs to be saved. This is a this is an eyelid, you know, around the eye. I can even see some of my eyelashes. So I know I'm safe to go ahead and this is holding. A little meat stretched out. I know I can do that. Now you're getting around the inside corner of the eye, of course, you gotta be a little careful. I could have went ahead and not skinned the mouth out yet. Even. But old habits die hard. I see way up here in the inside. That's, you can see where it's stretched out? The inside corner of the eye, just like on a deer or anything. So I can see it. See it right there? It's hard bone with a thin layer of skin on it. All I gotta do is ruin the tip of your knife or exacto blade or whatever you're using right over it. You can see it right there stretching and Coming undone. You feel it giving away right here. There's the eye, it's done. Here's the lower jaw. Back corner of the lower jaw, if I was doing a, see it's all right there. What I'm gonna do is get the other eye and it'll basically, uh, it's all this freeing up. We're all safe. The same thing in the other eye. And then inner eye should expose itself. You'll see the eye, or the eye skin, I mean. A lot of times I'll go ahead and thin skin right around the eye. It's unimportant skin. I can see the eyeball now. At least we know what's important and what's not.
And I already know some women and Inside corner of the eye, make sure you're not the good and sharp. Okay, and through it. There we are. Now we start fleshing. Expose your animal properly. Have something set up where they, either they can take it away or you can take it somewhere. Okay, I know my tail is four and three eighths. So I'll go right to the base of the tail. And three eighths is a little bit less than, uh, I may go about four and a quarter, somewhere in that range. And you can do temporary bases. Just to mount the animal. And I may do that yet. But on this one, I may like use a fleshing beam or something, you know, to pin the back. You know, something easy where it's uh, going all the way down through the middle of the body. So there's little tricks you can do to mount him, you know, to mount these guys. Not to mention, I may have to cut off some body parts, like legs or something, and glue them back. That's possible. It happens a lot. I'm going to run my Dremel tool. You know, I don't want to destroy the anatomy or anything, so pretty much right down the middle. I'm going to go ahead and Dremel up through there. If I need to tuck some skin, that's a good place to do it. And the same right here. You know, I may want to go up. Oh, heck, maybe about right there. And on the other side, you want to do the same thing. You want to, not far, but you got to realize, yeah, there is a, you know, that is an arm and it is cocked back. So you're going to have some loose, you have a lot of loose skin, but it's also, you're going to have to tuck some for it to look realistic. So I'm going to Dremel that out. And basically, you're going to Dremel. Uh, you don't want to take away the form of the whatever you got to Dremel for. Back legs. Let's see. This leg over here. I don't think I have to do any Dremeling. I may have to do a little bit right here, maybe. We'll have to wait and see. It's better safe to go ahead and do it, though, really, because uh, that's just the way it's got to be. Something else to consider is remember that the incision, <coughs> excuse me, remember the incision goes along the back almost up to the base of the head. So basically, the incision is going straight up the top, and when it goes back here, it's going to go to one side, twist around, and kind of go up the back of the neck a little bit. They do got a lot of loose skin and it does allow for movement of skin displacement and everything. But I think it's better to go ahead and try to keep the incision along the back, you know, within reason, you know, so it's a good mount. Let me say that again, I wasn't in the frame. Yeah, you want the incision to go along the back and within reason, you kind of want it to go around 
work its way up the back of the neck to where the you know where the incision stops because when I pretty much done that when we uh, skinned it out we went right straight along the back straight up the neck a little ways before I stopped my incision so pretty much you need to incorporate that into your mount as well you know where the incision lays everything's about anatomy a little more corn prep before we start on the cake and I figured it's a good way to let you see it go ahead and just do it right here if I can you gotta watch out for debris coming out too this foam stuff it'll get in your eyes when I use a dermal tool I make sure the air is either going I make sure it's not blowing towards me if I can getting off what I can without getting too close uh, I threw some uh, dry preservative or borax whichever one you have on hand they both work really good and uh, just start getting off what I can just like I would on a deer head or anything else if you're worried about it you could go ahead and do the eyes and the you could do the face first just like I would on anything else. I think I can get my fleshing done relatively quick on this guy. I'm not like overly worried about it. But just roll the meat off with the edge of your blade. I definitely wouldn't trust using my fleshing machine on, on one of these thin skinned guys. But I have heard guys using bird fleshers. Like on uh, coons and stuff like that. The old saying, uh, nothing ventured, no, nothing gained. I've never tried it, so I don't know. But you flesh it out just like you would anything else. And uh, keep using your fleshing agent, whether it's borax or dry preservative, either one. I went ahead and washed it a little bit just to get some of the dirt off. I guess you say like a pre-wash. Hadn't been degreased or anything. I just wanted to get some of the smell off for one thing. Well, I'm going to do this when I get around the eyes. I'll show you. Basically, I'm going to go down to the back of the neck here, turn it over, and get a little bit more. But when we get around the eyes, I'll show you what's going on. Okay, you sort of got to pay attention where you're at. Here's one eyelid. Here's the other eyelid right here. And right here. Is those little hairs that come out where the brow, uh, brow is so I know not to cut it so it takes a little bit of concentration kind of knowing where you're at you know if you're trying to get what you can with your flesh and knife and you can get all this later with a razor blade if you if you'd rather Just like you would a deer. I also tried to kill off like maybe some of the bacteria on this. I put it like in a, some salt water, like about a pound per uh, gallon or something like that. Just trying to kill some of the, you know, I did that and for a few minutes and then I went ahead and washed it. And it seems like the salt kind of thickened the hide it where it's a little bit tougher. And I kind of like that. I just uh, don't care much for germs. I can keep from it. They get anything any other animal can get. They can get parvo or, you know, just have an early stage of it or something, rabies or anything. So I try to keep things clean if I can. You know, especially working on these critters. 
The deer are kind of vegetarian like. I don't worry as bad about them. But these things can get a lot of, you know, they'll eat anything. They could eat something with some kind of disease and then uh, they'll get it. You might could go ahead and get the ears while you're here. I mean, we are right here. I mean, you can't go wrong doing that. If anything, it's better. Because a lot of slippage starts around, around the ears anyhow. Exacto knife right here. It's still sharp because we only used it uh, a little bit. It's not a bad idea to go ahead and do it, do it now. Because at a slippage, it's where it starts first, usually. Or I don't want to be handling it when it's about to go bad, I guess is a better way to put it. If it is going to go bad. I don't always do this, but it's not a bad idea. I could just flesh it and use a razor later. Just got to watch what the end of your blade's doing. Doesn't hurt to stop occasionally, kind of, you know, get a little idea where you're at. Got my sharpening skill in there, and I guess you could say what I'm doing is uh, applying a little bit of pressure, just enough to run either my razor, my knife, or my exacto knife along where it's uh, got a little pressure, and what it does. It opens it up, see? Is that separating? You get the end to open up the way you want it to open up. So that's separating and opening up. You can see it moving and, and opening up on the sides even. And you just keep doing that until it's until you feel like you've got it good enough. Might be able to use your fingers too and then put it in a bind sort of. Like right here, I know it needs to be opened. And it's opening. And we're rolling over a little bit on the side here. Get her now. Keep doing that, get what you can, put a little preservative on it or borax and let it uh, dry some of the slickness out so you can get a little bit more meat off. And just keep on rolling. Even right down here on the end, you just uh, try to be careful but rake your knife all the way to the end of the skin. And uh, try not to get any hair. Just go over it several times until you can't get any meat to roll over, just like you would on a flesh and a deer head or anything. This is not good flesh and bean for a 
for a smaller animal. You might want a different one. You can order a smaller flesh and bean, but at the same time, I think you look just exposing the skin and folding it over if need be or whatever just to keep getting it. Hasn't bothered me much. See, I got this done. You might want to choose to do the legs first. Like right here. I can choose to do the legs and then just uh, so there's not no weight, you know, trying to pull it down. Maybe flop another leg over here. Do one leg at a time before you start on the main body. And you're getting some of the wetness out. Because I did kind of try to wash it a little bit first, kind of a pre wash. Had to get stink out of it. And diseases and all that stuff. You get these little stuff, you can pop them off and whatever. And even right up here on top. A lot of times you can you can get some of this stuff off. Not much though. But as you go up the leg, it seems like you get where you can get more off at a time. Well, that was the first run. A lot of wetness. I use dry preserve, but the borax, I, I think I actually like it a little bit better. Seems like it does a better job, really. A lot of loose meat right here. But I'll make another run with my knife again. Nothing right there. Maybe a little bit. Right down here in places. If you can get that tip down in there under that meat and it wants to roll, then it probably needs to come off. Go ahead and get it off. Right down here, there's a little. You take it all the way. I like to go ahead and take it off all the way to where the body is so I don't have to worry about my legs anymore. Put a little bit more right here. And try from a different direction. Sometimes I go this way with it. You're using the other side of the knife, sometimes it's super sharp. And turn the leg over and do the other side. All this meat can come up. preservative on it. Get your knife is good and sharp. Now you can dig some of this padding out too, like on the bottom of the foot. Some of it will come out. Just try not to put holes. You can see this. Pad. Hey. 
wants to come out and it's not hard to get out, go ahead and get it out. All this see, can come off. I take it all the way out to the body. But I do all four legs that way. You'd be surprised how much you can get on a big old flesh and bean even. I've already went over it once, so I'm going over it again trying to get off what I can. Just like you would if you were doing a deer head. Just keep doing that. Make sure you check him all over. Make sure you got everything off the main body. The only thing I got left is the face. And I'll do that sitting down. And all we got left. Splitting the lip to doing the eyes. I think I'm going to go ahead and get the eyes while I'm here. Go as close as I can. Cut away that excess. I can see the outline of it. I get as close as I can. Inside the corner of the eye. Make sure I get that real good. Below the eye. Get the upper eyelid here. This is where the eyelashes are and all that. Right here, there's some whiskers. Yeah, pretty self-explanatory. You just got to do it. It's just got to be done. I don't want to cut none of those eyelashes. That'd be rough. Try to get what I could with a knife to, uh, for one thing, you can kind of prolong the sharpness of your razor blade. So I've gotten around the eyelid for the most part. Still some meat up here on top, so I'm gonna use my the sharpness of my razor blade to go ahead and cut down a ways. I kind of want to get as close as I can to these uh, eyebrow hairs, but I don't want to cut through the follicle so I'll just kind of scrape over it sort of you know, as close as I can get. Here again the inside corner of the eye. I want to leave all that dark stuff but I want to get just below it if I can. You know the, the dark stuff that, that surrounds the eye I think I want to leave most of that. I may even take some of that off. Put maybe a little bit around the brow on this one side. It's a good time to go ahead and Split the lips and let you see that. I went ahead and got both my eyes real good. Just run my razor around here. Here's a little bit where it's still close. With his nose too, right? All this skin's down. There's a little piece of cartilage that probably could lift on the animal but right here above the nose see here's what was just extra See this above the nose? I'm bringing it out as far as I can. I'm running uh, my razor along this white membrane. Just the upper part of the nose. Right in here. If 
taking that nose pad all the way to the end. And I think I've done it right there. We're about to rest on that later. Now I'm going to go ahead and split the lips. And I'm just going to run my razor right down the back of this big hit lipper. If I was doing an open mouth, I'd want to keep all this. So it's a trick. you got to go above the hair follicle and uh, below the lip. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I'm doing. Above the hair follicle and below the lip. So here's the hair follicles, here's the lip, there's the nose cartilage, and I'm turning it inside out. Well, slowly as I run my blade across it. I almost want to cut under the whisker padding and work in after you get below it. This will be how I kind of handle that. right here in front below the nose that'll work down a little keep back on this other side Okay, looking pretty good. Okay, now we're coming up on some hair follicles. I'm skim right over all those hair follicles. Okay, working my way around the inside corner of the lip. Here's what I got so far. The inside corner of the lip. Inner lip seem to be fleshed out pretty good. Maybe a little right here. I gotta work my way all the way around anyway, so. Yeah, I'll split the lip first and I kind of flesh the lip later if that makes any sense. That's the corners of the upper part of the nose. Upper right and left corner. You can still separate a little of this membrane here. I'll take it down as far as it'll go. It's going down pretty far. Well, further than I thought it would. Well, you don't want to get too far. Okay, that's going to work. I'm going to go ahead and split the lower lip now. Or work my way around, I should say. Now we're coming around the inside corner of the lip. We're going to the lower lip. And down here, not a whole lot of tucking room. Of course, I don't need it. Because... This is a closed mouth. Now with the upper mouth, you want to leave some extra lip for, you know, bending around and tucking on the inside of the open mouth. If that makes any sense. But still here, I've got the sharp edge of my razor. I'm running it just below the, the, I'm running it in between the lip and the, that lip padding on the lower, on the lower lip. 
Some of them are super tedious right here anyway. Hardly have room for anything to grab hold of, but I can peel it back a little bit with my thumb and rake that knife over that. Now we're right here. This every animal has this on both sides of his lip. He's got this, and I can even split that for some cuck and see. If it was open though. Now they'll yeah, good shape. There we are. Okay, let's put the lips all the way around. Now just pick you aside. I'll start right here on the right side. And I guess I'll flush the lips first. Take advantage of the blade while it's sharpest. I don't need much tucking because it's a closed mouth. If it's an open mouth, I have on all that lift that I could get when I want to flesh it out. I'm going to flesh out those lips because it was, it's an open mouth. Just separate it as far as it can go, you know, without uh, doing any bad damage. This is actually excess meat right here, so I can come off. Let's see, I'm looking right here. All this is excess meat can come off. And all this is excess meat can come off. I'm gonna flush these lips all the way around. Taking the edge of the razor while it's at its sharpest. And I just keep going around, split my lips all the way around. Well, they're already split, but like there's little bits of meat on there, go ahead and Get it off with your razor blade. Scissors come in handy too. Sometimes you can just, instead of trying to fight it with a razor blade. Let's get that padding real quick. Okay, here's some padding up here. Starts on one side. Go ahead and start shaving it off. So here's below the nose. No, here's on the side of it right here. As soon as come in handy, you don't have to fight all that little minute stuff. You just snip it and be done with it. Now what I could do is go in between these follicles right here and run my razor between them without cutting the follicles. Cut to that meat just a little bit to the skin maybe. 
and that lets the preservative get in there. And uh, I could even run this way with it. You don't want to, but you gotta be careful. You, you really don't want a cat with no whiskers, in other words. You gotta be super, super careful. Okay, that'll come off. See, now I've got the whiskers on one side. I'm tickled with it good enough. Preservative can get in between there and preserve what little bit of meat that's down in there. Same with the other side here. I've got my nose already. If I wanted, what I like to do is I like to cut as far as I can without you know, cutting uh, too much of that nostril stuff. But I'm going to go ahead and use a razor while it's sharp and get the padding on the other side here. I can already see the follicles. You know, some of them. Main thing is you don't cut through all of them. If you accidentally cut one or two, that's no big deal, but You know, cat's got to have whiskers, you know. I'm kind of doing a raking motion more than a slicing motion. Yeah, you know, I've got control of how deep I go, I guess, with a cutting. It's the right word. Back down here to the whiskers again. You've got all those follicles you got to kind of shave over. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going over them. I don't want to go into them. Get a little snip. There we go. Again, I'm kind of doing a raking, I guess you could say, motion. Definitely don't want to cut through all those follicles. This is the other side. And it's the same thing on this side. You just want to. Be super careful with it. We want some super small ones down here on the end. So I got pretty close with these follicles. So what I'll do is I'll run the, run my blade in between each row if I can. And I can. impossible kind of up underneath but I don't want to want to cut into the follicle but you can kind of you get what I mean make sure that preservative gets in there even if you do leave a little bit of meat in between there friends that's good enough for that okay now that we got the whiskers I could go ahead and hack this nose off I want to get all the way to the end I want to try to save some of that inner cartilage I guess is the right word so I mean, I want to save some of that inside for uniformity. I don't want to cut it all off. So I want to, might leave, oh heck, I'll 
probably a little bit. Let's see what we can do here. Yeah, it looks pretty good to me. I don't know if I want to leave much more than that. I think that's pretty good. That'll work. I know I could always trim more, but I don't want to lose the your nostrils in there, you know, the inner part of it. So I'm tickled with it. Yeah, let's see what we got here. Now we're back on the lower lip. Or that padding on the lower lip. I got a lot of it with my knife. Here again, just do a scraping motion. Not, not really going extremely, not really slicing per se. You just kind of get a little in between scraping and slicing. And it controls your depth. And still allows you to cut. I guess that's the right way to put it. Get a, a layer of that padding will come off. Get what meat I can off the top, and then, uh, but now that we got all the meat off of it, those are just like little hair follicles. I I think that's what there is. Some, it's that patty material. I don't know what you call it. A lot of animals, even deer, coyotes, they all got it. Foxes. A little bit of padding underneath. Well, since I shaved off what meat I could, I do the crosshatch pattern again. I go like this. I don't want to go all the way through. It's real easy to cut through right here. But I want to get some depth. So I'll run my razor this way. You can see it cutting through. Not all the way through, of course. And then I'll go this way with it. And then as sure as a preservative gets down in there. And does its thing. See now it's all cross hatch pattern going all the way to the skin, which allows that preservative to get down in there. Now we gotta do is get the ears. This one's almost all the way done. So I'm just using my sharpening steel and I'll put it in my ear to help me uh, separate the end. See what I'm doing, running that blade right along the edge. Where the membrane is. And yeah, you gotta be tedious with it. Especially on these cats. You kind of feel it with your fingers when you're when you're pretty much close to being done or not. Preferably like a big old pan or something. But if you don't have one, just make do with what you got here. Just start preserving everything. See any bits of meat, uh, meat, go ahead and get it off. Go ahead and get down in those whiskers real good. Even around this nose real good. Make sure you get that preservative all around there real good. Even around these whiskers, I may give it a couple extra squirts. Oh, I went ahead and degreased it in uh, camp teal oil. Degreased it in camp teal oil. 
and then I washed it real good with the degreasing uh, Dawn dish soap. So that should take care of everything as far as any grease problems. You know, like on down the road. Because I've seen animals that haven't been degreased. And yeah, it's noticeable. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. Here on the patty down here, I did a cross hatch pattern down here with my razor blade, so I want that preservative to get down in there real good too. Let it do its thing. Make sure he's kind of good and damp. Want that preservative to really set in, I guess. The preservative is all good. Ears aren't dry enough or anything. All that junk and make sure that stuff's on there real good. All the way to the end where the tips of the ears are. All that. Make sure this one's good too, like that. Pretty much the whole animal, the paws, everything. And then we'll invert him. Basically, just uh, rub the dry preservative all over him. Make sure you get his legs real good. I'll go ahead and get this and. Uh, We'll invert it. Make sure you got that stuff everywhere. Well, let's go ahead and work on the invert in this guy. Get it as good as I can. Right here, let gravity go as good as it'll go. Try not to let the leg twist and all that stuff. Seems to help. Now, a lot of times I can trap air in there. And it helps and you know trying to get it to invert seems to help sometimes I'll get my sharpening steel in there and Try to help it out. But you don't want to jam stuff, that's for sure. And once you fill a toenail, you can pull with that toenail and it'll, it'll invert it for you. But I don't fill a toenail yet. So that's kind of like the issue we have with these guys is getting them re-inverted. Keep reaching in there, trying to slowly work it out. And you can, it just takes a little while. If you pull in the right area, Oh, I can feel a toe. Oh, that helps. If you pull in the right area, it kind of unravels, sort of.
Let, I'm letting air help and I'm pulling. Yeah, see air. Air can help. Air helps better than anything. Oh, look at that. Oh, just ever so smoothly. When it decided it wanted to go, it went. So we got to do all four legs that way. I forgot to get, uh, forgot to put preservative in the tail too. That's a super simple feet. Get some preservative and stick it down in there. Kind of poke that preservative and make sure it gets down in there all the way. Want it to go all the way down in there. Probably still wet in there, but could be dry down in there. I don't know. This, that's down in there as far as it'll go. I don't even help it out if it needs it. I don't think it needs it. I just try to go in there without the leg twisting. If I can keep from it. And while it's loose like this, you could probably go ahead and pull a little bit. And probably even use air pressure. See how it's coming real easy? Coming real super easy right now. You just keep working. Working this right here. So between like just squeeze and, and let air pump up through there. And unraveling it usually does pretty good at getting these guys inverted. A lot of times I'll grab, get my hemostat or a needle. I've got a claw here I can pull out. A lot of times that helps. A lot of times that's all it needs. And everything else comes out. There we go. Not bad. Nose pliers. Grab a claw and pull it out. We've got a bondo the ears. I usually like to go back from the very back of my incision. Like here's my ear. I get it in a good position. I know I can dip enough bondo down in this gap here. And same as like on a deer, I haven't cut my ear canal off yet. That ought to be plenty, I think. A little bit harder. Already know I'm not going to have a whole lot of time. Sure, that's good enough. Let's see. I'll let that get down in there. That ought to be plenty. I think that's plenty. Maybe a little bit more. Right in here. Try to be neat with it. I know it's easier said than done. Let that ear drop right back down. See what it's doing. Yeah, there's plenty in there. Try to get some of this excess off the skin. May have to go back in there and do a little bit of doctor work. But I guess what I'm getting at is it's, it's in there. You've got Bondo in places where you don't want it on, on the inside of the cape, obviously. So, it's something else we gotta, something else you'll have to work out. Ooh, it had a little hole there. Didn't even know it had a hole. Okay. And so you want you want you want the bobcat to have that natural ear position so you try to control how everything is still got time to work it not much still got a little time in fact it's probably already starting to harden i hold it like how it needs to where i think it needs to look Uh, 
know, just decent, you know, a nice, decent looking ear. Everything's aligned up good. That can harden up to its heart's content. I'm holding it just the way it like it needs to look. We'll cut the excess off later and straighten it up on the inside. I mean, it'll kick here a little bit. Oh yeah, it's setting up good. Good looking ear, everything's uniform. I had a little bit of Bondo leak out of the ear and I waited until it got a little bit rubbery and I just flaked it off. And that's another good option. You know, before it gets hard, let it get rubbery enough where it will, uh, you know, you can flake it off. Come on the inside of the ear. A lot of this just comes right off. It's still not hard yet. I probably ought to wait a little bit longer. I would rather wait, make sure I have a good hard ear before I pamper with it too much. I think, but it's getting there. I give it just a little bit more. If you trim excess bondo, you want to leave all this right through here and try to leave all this too. So basically, Pretty much just got it good enough. Maybe a little bit canal. Sometimes I think I leave a little bit of canal on even. I'm pretty sure I do. But here's what I got. Straight across, right through here. There's where the that's where I cut. This is what I got right here. That's perfect. I like that. I'm leaving a little canal on, but hey, it's gonna look good. Squeeze behind the Bondo. I usually use paper towels, but these things are so small. You know, like on a deer I would. Squeeze behind the Bondo so you know it's going up into the ear. It's like air pockets or something. Okay. Okay, definitely got plenty of Bondo in this guy. There we are. Now have we got room to Looks like the air pocket went out. Now, there we are. Same on this side. Make you a real good, good ear. Try to match your other ear, because, you know, it's easily done to make one ear wide and one ear not as wide or something. Well, it's already set up. There we are. Let that dry for a few minutes. Now here's what the ears look like. I think they look pretty good. I mean, look really good. I just wanted to add, uh, now when I glue around the eyes, I basically just follow the shape of the eye that I made with my clay. And it's uh, that simple. Now we just, uh, Start figuring out the best way to put our cat on, depending on the pose and whatever. We know the head could pop off right now. I could cut a leg off or two to make this guy fit if need be, or I could even cut him in half and then just glue him back together. There's different ways. Let's see what we can do here. Here's the back legs. It's for one, one leg. Now, a lot of people put caulk in the feet. Now what I do is I'll make an incision in the bottom of the foot and then I pump my caulk in there. And then uh, just uh, you know, epoxy sculpt it back before I paint it, and you'll never even know anyway. That's the way I do it. It's a lot easier to me. Some people use uh, clay and get up in there with clay. You can kind of want to baby them, even when you're mounting them, because you could, I mean, you can cause hair slippage, uh, you know, while you're mounting if you're not careful. Just, uh, 
something I figured I'd throw at you there. Let's see. A lot of times I use little pins to help me. Make sure it's one with a point. Oops, went all the way through there. But needless to say, that foot is on there. That's how it goes. I may go ahead and line stuff up a little bit. There we are. It goes there. That way when I'm trying to work something else, it's not slipping down. Oh, this is going to be easy fit. I don't have to do anything. Sometimes that's the look of the draw. If this is going to be a tight fit, I could cut the body in half. I could cut an arm off if I had to to get it to fit. I have run into that quite often. It, it depends on the pose. I just got lucky on this one. And apparently I don't have to do any of that. So... That's working out pretty good. Plus it wasn't a super tight fit, which always helps. That's always a plus. Now I'll get the, the hair color patterns a little bit later. I've got lots of reference material on Bobcats. Sure do. There that foot is. There that is. There that is. I think that's about right here. Good place to put a pin. There we are. That just keeps skin from sliding back down when I'm trying to adjust and everything. So I think that's pretty good. That's as far as front paws are. Go ahead and get this, this arm. Now I think I may be able to use my flesh and bean to kind of balance him on. That's what I'm hoping. If we can, that will be an easy way for me to pin him up. Sometimes you got to make, uh, I've had made, like for leaping ones and stuff, I've made uh, temporary bases. And sometimes mount my turkeys even. You know, I'll make a temporary base sometimes before actually making a real base. Which is probably better just to go ahead and make the base, you know, for the pose that you're going to do and then mount him on that base. But I've got some that I use over and over again. Like to mount turkeys on and stuff. I mean, that way you can you might order a base that's already made, and your animal could be drying. Go ahead and mount your animal while you're waiting on the base. Yeah, if we have a lot of loose skin, then uh, it's probably good that we made some little uh, grooves for tucking. Okay, that one goes like that. I think that's perfect. Kind of lining up the hair. That's it right there. 
There we are. A lot of time there, the hair coloration gives you an idea kind of roughly where, you know, your hair patterns need to go. That goes like that. That's correct. That's like that. That's how that foot's going to go. That is pretty darn good. I can even see a little belly streak right down the middle. And it's already right down the middle. I don't worry about putting anything on the tail because their tails are so fluffy that you're not going to notice it anyway. Now if there was a tight spot, seems like towards the rump is a little bit tight for some reason. I'll turn the tail up like that just to kind of hold it. You know, as far as pinning him up and doing my final work, I could do it right on where it, what he's going to be on, you know, on the limb. Or I could go ahead and do my fitting and stuff on the fleshy beam. He fits on both of them. Yeah. Uh, get a little. I'll go down the legs here in a little bit with it. There, place it where it's more apt to drum and stuff. It might not hurt to put some. Look, I use a straight edge and put alignment marks around it, and so it helps me to glue the head back just the way it was. I'm gonna go ahead and stick this head in here. Just had to kind of help it out a little. There it goes. I have to glue it and hold it, that's what I gotta do. Trying to keep this from sagging down so much. Glue the heck out of it. Where it's gonna stay. Make sure the hair stays out of it. There we are. Where I'm pinning the seam, I'm putting T-pins. I'm trying to align the skin up a little bit. I'm not, if that makes any sense at all. When I start pinning, I'll pull those T-pins out. It's just for alignment purposes. Holds everything in place. I know when I cut it, I went straight up the back. So technically, I should be able to just uh, go straight up the back with my T-pins and just cinch it shut. Should be able to just pin that hole together. Making sure I have enough room to pin that big shotgun blast on the other side. So I'm kind of just pinning everything to get it in place. Yeah, I just got a couple of pieces of wire that I tend to like to use. Keeps the nostril in place too. There we are. There we are. Kind of hold the, the nose in place. I got pins holding the ears in place. Oh, I also mentioned uh, like this hair that uh, we're going to blow dry it out later. But I want to make sure there's enough skin for this hair to, uh, you know, fluff out. So I made sure to get my T pins in there. 
So basically I'm pulling skin forwards so that nothing's stretched out. The ears can come forwards like they need to. The fur on the side of the head, those little tufts of fur that are common for bobcats and lynxes. I made sure that stuff comes out. So it's not going to be a problem later. The brighter colored hair, like on the chest, it comes up and sweeps around under the neck because his head's turned. So that this is accurate. This is actually really accurate. With these pins, and kind of put everything in place. And all I got to do is start pinning with the little pins. So here we've got this big old blast. Let's see what we can do here. Free of any loose skin anywhere I've got. Plenty of loose skin here. Not much there. Okay. Well, this is what it's supposed to be then. If it's tight this way, chances are good that, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's, it's tight. If it's tight that way, chances are good. If it's, that means if it's loose on this side, this is probably what needs to be done right there. Well, I can hear those coyotes howling outside. Can you hear those? Scary. Every time an ambulance goes by or something. I kind of wonder if it might be better than sewing because it doesn't leave any kind of a you know, buckling of the skin really. It's just meshed together and uh, flattened out. Spray it down so I can see what's going on. I don't know if you can see it real good, but you can see where I, I glued my piece of foam in and th then there's a big gap back here. Well, I just filled that up with clay. Plus it's on the back anyway, nobody's going to see it. But what it is, it's just a gap. It can easily be fixed. I knew it was, I already knew it was here. Already had this taken care of. There we are. See the seam, it's already laid out for us. All we gotta do is pin it up. There we are right there. There we are. Okay, I went ahead and put some screws on him to kind of cradle him where he don't keep trying to twist and fall over. I'd be more apt to do damage, like maybe rub hair off or something like that. This could be like almost like you could consider it a temporary base until I get him mounted and then I put him over on the other one. I'm going to set the eyes when he, while he's on the thing because he's going to be all lined up anyway. So I'll go ahead and mount him. And then I'll go ahead and... Uh, um, not set the eyes, but uh, do the eyes and the lips. I'm going to do all that. So what I do is I get my pin pusher and I wet it where I can see it. I go right up the middle, stick my pin in. I don't put them all the way in until I'm completely done. I know it takes a while that way, but uh, I got a faulty pin pusher anyway. And I probably go about, I don't know if it's a quarter inch apart, maybe a quarter inch, somewhere in that range or, or less. I'll go one side for a good stretch and go up the other side for a good stretch. And I just keep taking turns as I'm pulling out the T-pins. And it's slow and tedious. I tend to be that way a little bit anyway. I can push these down a little bit. They don't have to be extremely far out, but I mean, what I'm getting at is my pin pusher doesn't pull them all the way down anyway. Put one in to kind of cinch the seam up it just seems like if you're pinning and you go all the way in with your pins you can get lost you know you know where your order is and uh, possibly uh, have a big long stretch where you don't have any pins or something you know 
Now there's also wires inside the form, and you'll know it when you get on one of those wires. And I just did. Basically all you gotta do is just hit it from a slightly different angle and it'll go in. You just gotta bypass that wire. Where is the head of your needle will hit that wire, that support wire that's uh it's kind of like a frame for the form. So you just pass that up and then you're in good shape. Okay, I pulled out a few more pins. A few more of my T pins opened up another about an inch and a half slot there and I'll go ahead and pin it up basically you go where your last one was in and just keep going with your pin pusher I'm usually pretty good at sewing but usually when I get around the neck, it gets too tough. Just pin it all the way up, and then I'll show you what we got. What I do is I run it up one side, then I run it up the other side. Actually, I don't even really have to use the pin pusher yet. It's just up here behind the neck, really. Like right here, I can just use my fingers, just just poke them in. The skin is that soft. Now all the pins are kind of in. Now all I gotta do is just push them the rest of the way in. My pin pusher or some other object to, to bury the head down to the skin. I've got a faulty pin pusher, which means I can only get them in so far, but I'll go ahead and do that. Get them in as far as the pin pusher wants to get them. It won't take long, just a few minutes. Okay, now I just want to push the needle all the way down to the skin. And I even take the time to make sure there's not a lot of hair, you know, that the head of the needle is trying to pin down. You know, I try, I try to make sure as I push the needle in, it goes in between the hairs. And it helps hide the incision even more that way. But here again, I'll go ahead and poke all these guys in all the rest of the way since my faulty pin pusher won't do it. And then I'll get back with you what I think the next logical step should be. Basically, I just do what I got to do to get him mounted. But I get back with you after I push all these pins in. Okay, got him all pinned up. I'm going to go ahead and blow dry the seams where the shotgun blast was and all that stuff. It makes it where it's a lot less noticeable. It really does make a difference too. You so. can probably do the whole cat if you wanted to, or most of it. You see him back here on the neck, and push the shotgun blast. Yeah, I wetted it down anyway so I could see where to put my pins better. So really it is a good thing to go ahead and do this. Now with it kind of blow dried, at least on the seam, uh, on the seam, the legs still need a little bit more blow drying and around the face, but that's at least the seam and a majority of the body. What it is, the, the hair mats down and a lot of times I'll, uh, kind of rake it a little bit to get the hair where it rises up off the skin because the water will mat it down. So the blow dryer just kind of fluffs it up and brings it back up. And uh, also lets you know your color pattern so you can adjust your skin accordingly. Now what I like to do to give my feet a little bit of body, and what it is, they'll dry and shrivel up and you won't have no feet. So what I like to do is put an incision right in the palm or right in that padding, I guess that's the right word, the padding. I just get my knife, 
and make an incision. That's what I'll do. I'll do it on the form. I mean, what it's going to be mounted on. I'll go ahead and do it. All four of the paddings. Do the front one here. And don't don't make it any bigger than it has to be. It ain't got to be big. Just big enough. I could put some wire down in there with some hot glue on the end. Make the hole first. And glue some wire on it. And then this, this is 12 gauge or 10 gauge might even be better for a better anchor. And I'll go like this. Plus you got wire running through that arm. So it's really a good idea. You can run this. Go like this up through here. You know, girl, you had a hole first. Put some hot glue on here. Get it back far enough where you know it's going to be a good anchor. And this part goes through your wood. And then on the back of the wood, shoot some staples or and, and glue it or whatever and, and anchor it in real good. That's a good way to do it. You can put some glue on here. Either way, it'll work. Just put a lot of glue on there. Put it in my anchor hole. Or make sure I don't get any on the cape. Make sure it's that 90 degree angle that we want. Probably even let that dry for a second. Okay, I've got this right here. I just want to go ahead and work it over. There we are. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll go ahead and pump the feet full of caulk. Well, this one has to be done anyway before we put it on the form. Get to bring that hole in the padding. I kind of want to go above a little bit too. So for the finger, for the sake of the fingers, well, uh, it's just kind of a guessing game how much you put in there. I just get a little bit of my super glue and glue the padding back together. Super glue gel is the best stuff, but if you ain't, get, ain't got none on hand. It's the next best stuff. And you just put it back together the way it was. Throw some glue in there. I'm just gonna run some along on that wire down into that hole. Okay. And then pushing back down onto all that hot glue. Put some glue on the wire in the hole and push it back down. There we are. That is a lot sturdier. Remember, I made those other incisions. That's about right, right there. I don't want to get too carried away with it. That looks pretty good. I think that's enough, yeah. Get our super glue gel. And uh, put a little in there and close this back up, no problem. These back feet already look good, but the thing of it is when you put caulk in there, it ensures it's gonna stay that way. Make sure everything lines up back here. You put any caulk down in here, we can go down in here real good. You see, basically just hang there. The front ones, I like to work the claws out. What you do, you squeeze right behind the claw. And you get it to push forward. You force it out. See, there's one. I just force these claws out. You get right in between, you can feel that last joint where you just keep straightening the joint out as it dries. See how it's doing that? As it dries, you work them. Eventually, they get where they stay out. So you pretty much just keep working them until... You let it dry a day or so and then just start... So I've already worked them out once, so that's kind of helped. A lot of people like these claws. They like, they like open mouths that show the thing. Sometimes they like the claws too. There's one claw out.
There's a claw out. Here's a claw out. I may mark that inside corner of the mouth. You can't miss it. You can see where the you can see where it's at. And I may just put a little black mark back there so uh, no confusion later when I start cooking. Now I start snipping the Pretty much like I do any other time. Probably leave maybe, I don't know, quarter of an inch or so for tucking. And up here up front. Just keep working my way all the way around. All the way around. Okay, now I'll go to the bottom. Now, if this is going to be an open mouth, you want to save all this skin right here. There's a place right there on a lot of animals, even on deer, where it comes up a little. Oh, let's see, that's in the way, but where it comes up. But since it's a closed mouth, it don't matter. I'm just going to cut straight through. Down here at the bottom. It should be fine. If maybe a quarter inch, maybe a hair a bit more. Okay, now I'm gonna start working on the head, so I'll uh, pin stuff back where I can Get the eyes pretty good. A lot of times I'll glue the head first before I even pin the back. Now luckily it's kind of a loose form because a lot of times I just have to, a lot of times I'll reach in with my fingers and just try to get glue where I think it needs to be. This is good for viewing anyway, so uh, it's a good thing the mouth stretched pretty good. It wasn't a tight fit, in other words, it was loose. And now I'm going to use my killer glue, two-part epoxy hide adhesive. Now I've got my killer glue, and I just want to go uh, basically just trace the eyelid and get in those grooves where you want uh, color patterns to stay. Some of the color patterns, uh, you know, are, are already are, the color pattern areas are made in the head. I mean, like you can see where the Little hairs pop up for the eyebrows and all that stuff. I'm going to try to stay out of the way. It don't take much either. Don't take much of it. This inside corner of the eye. Kind of hard to do unless I'm right on it, but uh, you'd never see it, so.
You know, it's easy to put a lot of glue and kind of, sometimes you can tell when you get too much glue on something, even a deer head or anything. That's looking pretty good. A lot of times I do get it on my eyes. And it's just a matter of having to clean them back off, but it helps when you're trying to, I don't know, glue everything in place. If you don't, if you can see the eyes, it helps, I guess is the right word. That's pretty good. So all this gets it. Um, any place where there's an indention and you want the skin not to pop out, which is pretty much everywhere. This all be good, easy for me because it's the uh, closest one. I try to run right up against that clay, you know, right where it stops. I wonder, I've never done it, but, you know, like how you, people will tuck for like deer, you know, the high tucking method where they leave a little skin so it'll tuck under. I'm assuming they could probably... I've never seen it done on bobcat. You know, I've seen it done on deer. I thought about doing it myself that way. Because you can push your details in your eyes and everything that way. It's a lot better. Than the way I've been doing it, I think. Right up here where the little eyelashes are going to go. Now, after I get all the glue where I want it to go, when I release the mouth down, I can reach in there with my finger and get under the under the jaw where it meets the neck and all that stuff. That's what I'll do. Basically, like I would on a deer or anything. I'm doing the same thing. You got hair coloration around the eyes. It goes down into here. Well, as you can see from the picture. So, uh, yeah. Got some neat stuff there. You got cheeks on these guys. With my finger from just... You know, don't reaching in with my fingers and doing it easily. Right here on my nose, you want all this to line up real good. Here again, you could use your fingers and do all this. I like to go in there and reach and just put that stuff in there.
probably don't want to get this stuff any worse than I want it to be as far as everywhere. I got my little piece of the wire here. Give me a tap where they'll stay. Don't take much. Just a, just a pop or two. Now we can start aligning stuff up. Basically, you just line everything up like you see in the picture. The wide around the eye. Everything. As I'm pushing up the inside corner of the eyes here. Now I'm working on the inside patch right here on the other side. That's the inside corner anyway right there. I like to use pins. I am trying to match everything the way it needs to go first. Didn't expect it to be a tight fit like this, but it sure is. Okay, the first thing. I make sure I get those eyes first before I do anything, really. I like using the yellow pens. They just seem to do a lot better on these little small kittens like this. Big old deer, it don't matter that much. It seems to matter on these bobcats. See the inside corner of the eye. I want to make sure all this is sticking out. Now even this little shady part right here, I want to match it up. Right, I don't want too much of it or something like that. I'm using my, this live reference right here. This inside corner of the eye is my issue right now. The one eye relatively good. I'm not going to complain too much. It could actually, even this one could come, yeah, about like that. About like that. I don't like using these big ones. I may take that out, put a small one. It really is better to use the small ones. You just get a lot more everything. Big ones sinks down too much. Just better off with the small yellow ones. <clears throat> but they can kind of help you get things straightened out, you know, at first. It takes a while to proportion. It sure does. And of course, you want the eyelids down. You don't want them riding up. Now I've already got the upper like pretty darn good. Upper is pretty darn good already. Okay. Now. Let me get some of this glue off. Oh, wow. Let's glue to something else. This comes around like that. I think that's accurate. Basically I'm just following the clay that I that I made earlier. That's all I'm doing as far as the the eyelid. But now the general anatomy from below the line eye see this needs to be 
Now the lid, it can go down. Now back here, that black patch behind the eye, it even does some, uh, there we are. Okay, we'll start tucking from the inside corner of the mouth. And it looks like for here, it's a, uh, where did I put that black spot? There it is. So right here. One go in. Black spot there it is. Tuck or pin, whatever you want to call it. Go ahead and get it in there. Let's see, this goes Let's see, I want everything to line up good All that's gonna line up good Okay, that's kind of got that that's good. Got a little bit of a tight fit, creating a little bit of an issue for me, but not much. See, that needs to go in. Okay. It's toughen. supposed to be anyway. Let's see, here's one. Put a handle on this one. Yes, there we are. There we are. Basically, any part of the dark part of the lip, I'll go ahead and try to tuck it in. They do have a little bit of a black outline, but I'll just paint that in. Even this black around here is a, it's a little bit too much. It needs to come up. Let's see. Let me go about right here. I'll take a small pin. Same on the other side. Basically, I'm compensating for a, looks like a tight fit. Basically, what I'm doing here. There we are. Now, even the white lines on the whiskers, I got them relatively close. Not perfect, but I got them close. Well, I hate to do it, but the heads are in the way. So, what I'm going to do is snip them right here. If I can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to do every one like this. Okay, that way I can see what's going on, you know, a lot better. At least I can see what I'm doing. Is a tight fit. Didn't expect it. Okay, now we're uh, putting some glue on the lower lip and underneath the chin and I gotta use my fingers, but I don't want to get messy. Not really. Not while I'm working on this cat, really. I got some of this stuff, and I got a lot of it. So I wanna wanna work it in. But basically, like I do on my deer, I want to get kind of close. But 
with my glue. Where I know it'll slide up in there and lock it in. I didn't even put any glue under these whisker areas because I've worked that out as it dries so they'll flake out real good. So I have a good looking cat. We'll put a lock right there, then. Okay. Just make sure you got enough under there. To do what you need to do. Line this lip up, so like right here. Right here in between. These black things down here at the bottom, the little black streaks that come out from the lower lip. Use your reference pictures for all that stuff. I like going ahead and tucking that lip out of sight. We paint it back in anyway. Do the other side the same way. Now all this. Remember I put all that down there. So that can go in. All this around the sides. Let's make sure it's uh, doing what it's supposed to do, you know. There's supposed to be a dent right here. And there is. All that goes around, all that goes around, plenty of glue. You can work it back to the neck even, if you want to. I'll work those whiskers over the next few days. I don't want to let the glue dry right now before I mess with it too much. Kind of how I want the ears, or at least one of them. You could probably shoot screws if you wanted to into it or something. These pins to hold everything in place. Even the ears. I sure do. At least for a few days until everything sort of starts to dry. Now just let him dry like that. I'm going to work the ears too. They're not going to be so stand up -ish. Now you can, I've got side views of cats too, different ear positions. And I'm going to make sure the eyes are sort of where they need to be, which I think they are. You know, really, really close anyway. I may have to do a little bit here and there before it dries. I'm going to also try to Do some tucking and, and mashing that hide plate paste in the place that we put on. So I've got a few more things to do. Maybe tomorrow I'll come in and flick the whiskers a little bit or something because it still won't be dry yet. 
I just want the glue to dry before I start tinkering with it too much. Okay, now I'm going to uh, just do a few things like uh, make sure this white is like it's supposed to be. Let's see, that's looking pretty good, actually. Where the hide paste is. What I do is I look at the mounts inside the taxidermy catalogs, the sample mounts, and they'll help you with letting you know where you need to put your, uh, you know, where you where the white needs to go and everything. You might even find the exact mount that you've got if they got a sample mount of it, and you just. Uh, accordingly and remember we got stuff to tuck too we can tuck right in there if we wanted to also we want this tail down and we want it to look natural so I think it needs to go about like that and then you want the end to bend up you know hair off the tail actually the very end is what needs to go up let's see I think that's good enough right there. You can blow dry it up if you want to. Now we just let it dry. So I pinned everything in place. Any place it was drumming, I just threw some pins in there and pinned it up real good. So it's in good shape. Well, over the next few days, I uh, make sure these whiskers come forwards. Because if not, they'll dry straight back. And it looks a little weird. So I make sure I get them going forwards at least then let the skin get a little harder and then the next day do a little bit more and it, it's more noticeable on uh on something like a cat or a coyote it's probably more more noticeable than it would be like on a uh well like say a deer been working the whiskers out I actually been grabbing them by my fingers and pulling them out some. You, you just don't want all the whiskers like just going straight back because it doesn't look good on a cat. This is, we got about right there. It's getting there. It, it, it's getting close. Yeah, eventually if you keep working the claws out, eventually they'll get where they'll stay. You know, a lot of people, you know, they like those claws sticking out, you know, make the bobcat look a little bit more fierce. I don't mess too much with the back feet. Now the back feet, they may, uh, I don't know, you may have to kind of work those to uh, get them where they stay. If you put enough caulk in them, they're not going to shrink that much. If you don't put any caulk, they'll shrink like crazy. Now that he's pretty good and dry, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, taking pins out. And I'll, I'll let you know a little bit about what we got it hanging on and how I got it jerry-rigged. Well, not really jerry-rigged, but how I got it where he can use it. Because we got one hanger that it hangs on. And then I even wrote down the distance. The distance below where the screw is, you've got anywhere between 4 and 1 8 and 5 and 5 8 inches. And then I've just got another hanger that's sideways for the pendulum effect you don't want the pendulum effect because it's heavy on one side so basically i got it rigged where he can find one stud and put two screws put one up here and then put another one oh about four and a half to five and a half inches below the screw hole on the same piece of, on the same stud in the wall and the bobcat's not going to go anywhere Everything around the head. 
Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. Down here where some of the glue is, you may need to really kind of twist with a pair of needle nose pliers. But these nose things come out, everything comes out. You know, instead of pulling right away, I always do like to kind of kind of twist first before I start, you know, pulling. I'll just get some lacquer thinner on the end of a Q-tip and I kind of douse and let it kind of saturate an area. My goal is I, it does something to the glue makes it where it wants to break off the glass a little easier. It should help with all that. Run it here. I'll let that sit for just like a minute or so and then I get my exacto knife. It's kind of like real rubbery now. I think it's a lacquer thinner that done that. Kind of hard for me to get with the camera in the way, but I'll do the best I can. So that's coming off. That exacto knife just kind of peels up under it. Kind of roughly what we got so far. Well, my goal is to get these eyes looking just like that. You know, even if I have to, for some reason, maybe cut a little of that black stuff off that's, a, you know, like maybe on the inside corner of the eye. Sometimes i got to even do that. But the main thing is, is you get them looking as close as you can. I use my two-part epoxy school to fill any gaps in. Sometimes you can do minor correction with not only the epoxy school, but maybe a little bit of the... Uh, you know, where you apply your paint and leave it. Sometimes little minute things can help a little bit to get your eyes looking right. And there was some glue that it, that it oozed out while it was drying. And I let it saturate on that for a little bit and it just plucked right off. And it's a good smooth transition. Uh, the glue held it in. Well, I used a whole lot of pins too. I tended to drill straight up. Maybe it would be easier if I drilled at an angle and went in. It'd be easier as far as pinning. So maybe next time I'll do that. Here's my epoxy sculpt, my two-part epoxy sculpt. Get like two little bits of it, uh, one of each. And we're not going to need much. And then I get a little lacquer thinner and start mixing it together. The lacquer thinner actually uh, thins it down. And makes it where it mixes good, makes it where you can work with it. These are some means uh, you can use water, but not, not doing this stuff. I don't think water would be a good thing to use to try to thin it down. So you just mix it, and I think we got it good enough where it can start using it. Pretty much just any kind of gap that you see. If you even see a gap. There's a little bit of gap right there. And then we can get a Q-tip of lacquer thinner on it later and straighten it out. If you know what I mean. Sometimes if it's hard to work with, at least get it in that area, and then when the Q-tip and the lacquer thinner goes over it, it'll kind of smoothen it in. Now that's if you've got places where it's kind of hard to handle or work with. Now remember, we're going to paint this, so some of these areas that are brown, even though they're not brown with the epoxy sculpt on it, well, they'll be brown again. I'm just filling in you know, grooves and gaps where there really shouldn't be any grooves and gaps. Filling those little imperfections down in there. A little of this stuff goes a long way, you know, if you 
especially if you did a pretty decent job with your mount. Lacquer thinner on a key tip. I've still got the shape of my eye right here. I got my reference picture for painting, all the way from modeling to painting, painting even and everything. Uh, sometimes it just it's essential. Sometimes it just comes in handy, if you know what I mean. Yeah, there were some grooves here where I had pins. Looked like I had too much glue and it just uh, kind of buckled. Filling in those places where it buckled, making it look smooth and soft again, like real skin. That's kind of my goal. I think I got the eyes where I need them, so now I'm just going to clean them off and get them ready for the to be painted later. We can kind of see what my eyes look like so far. You can see the little bits of a uh, epoxy sculpt and stuff. Well, that's going to be uh, all painted dark brown anyway. Don't know how good you can see it from your angle, but the end of the nose is like going down, kind of dipping down in the front. It doesn't look super bad from that angle. But a lot of times it gets real bad like on coyotes and foxes and stuff. And I'll simply just rebuild the nose back up with epoxy scope. It's going to get painted anyway. Not so much on maybe on this one, but some of them. It really is bad. On this one, the form had kind of a had kind of where it was dipping down a little bit in the front too, so can't say much for that. I'm not trying to make the nose longer or anything, you know, anything goofy like that. I just want to fill it in. With a Q-tip here, let the lacquer thinner melt it in. And what I'm getting at is, on the nose, there was wrinkles and stuff. And I kind of straightened it out. I want the profile to look, you know, a little bit good. It was dipping down a whole lot. If you got some big grooves or something, uh, this looks really good to me. I don't even think they'll notice it. But if you see little gaps or something in there, you can either use caulk or something. I've used caulk before and let it dry, you know, before painting. But you can also use, you know, your extra epoxy sculpt and fill in any places 
you know where that seam where you cut it might have showed this is good stuff this is a good friend to the taxiderm if i get any borax that's in the ears try to get it out can use q-tips you know it should just rub right off that borax toothbrush comes in handy sometimes the q-tip get some of that old borax down in there do all that stuff off then okay we got some white and just like on a deer i'll bring i'll try to paint or Ties up the white as the white will take me. Right up here in the front, even. Right up in here. Yeah, this can even be lined up a little right in here. Fine. I guess a person could brighten up the white that's on the on the face, but I'm not going to touch it. Yeah, a lot of times I mix white with a rich brown and come up with just kind of a basically the color like you've got now. But I have seen it where it was like just really white in there. I'm thinking it might not be wrong to you know, add some white in there. Maybe not go super strong with it. Of course, I didn't, I didn't use any. I didn't thin my paint down or anything. It just seems like it operates on this hair a lot better if you don't use all that junk. Actually, this bobcat did have kind of really white looking inside the ears. You still got to do. And the good thing that'll brush right out if I need to tone it down a little bit. I'm. I want my nose to be about that color. It's a. Uh, it's. It's like a flesh with a little bit of something else in it. And the closest I've come is just a little flesh with a bright orange in it and toning down the flesh making it a different color and I guess I could add some red to it too I've seen these noses I mean a lot of different colors I've seen taxidermists paint them different colors you can just look in the catalog and see everything from purple to to almost flesh to almost red it's just a lot of different colors I could probably actually add a little bit more red to this but I can always do that later Oh, see, it does look a little bit. I think I'm gonna add a little bit of red to it, just a drop or two. Uh, you can see what I come up with. Now we can tone it in later with dark brown too. So, uh, I mean, this is the final color, by the way. Essentially, this is just flesh with a uh, orange and a few drops of red to tone it down to make sure it's not so bright. Flesh is milky looking because it has so much white in it, so I kind of got away from that a little bit too. And don't worry about excess coming up there; it comes off with a Q-tip and lacquer thinner real easy. Try not to get on the white if I can, but it's no big deal if I do.
it's about as far as it goes anyway. Right there, the rest of it's just black. I may have looked at my reference pictures, but yeah, I think it's just all black from there. I mean, it goes down so far. Yeah, it went down far enough. Well, since I got this color, I'll go ahead and add just a little bit of a, ever so lightly, a little bit of a flesh color to the, to the ears on this guy. Ever so lightly. Even lighter than that. I got my pressure turned up, obviously. I went ahead and used some of this nose color in the ears to kind of get it, tone it down. It's pretty close. I need to go in there with maybe, uh, well, I need to clean the hair up. And after I clean the hair up, I may go in with a little bit of rich brown to tone it down a little bit. To try to make it match a little bit what I see right there. You can touch the ears up with a little bit of rich brown. Not getting carried away with it or anything. Kind of carrying around, kind of doing what's already rich brown, just kind of going back over it and giving a little bit of touching up there. There's a little overspray, which is going to happen anyway. See how easy it just comes off? A little overspray from the nose, it just comes right off. And use the other side. I don't know if y'all noticed, but for a minute, a dark brown that traces right around the top of the nose. So we gotta incorporate that too, because it's correct. A little thin strip of dark brown, just a light thin strip. It's noticeable. And dark brown is basically our last color besides the gloss. I'm gonna put a thin line of dark brown above the where the paint meets the brown, where the nose meets the hair. We're gonna put a thin line just like we do on a deer. We're gonna paint a thin black line, but noticeable, all the way to the very end. Where the upper and lower mouth meet and do it on both sides make sure it's noticeable then we're going to trim just like you do on a deer but just get the very outer extremity of the ear and do it all the way around you can see it on this guy on a live reference you can see it and i'm using live reference while i'm doing all this so and that goes all the way around there trim the ears in black in other words Missed a little, or, or dark brown, really. Dark brown down the inside of the ear. Tone a little bit of shading around through here. I can see it. So it doesn't hurt to go ahead and incorporate some of that back in. The paws. You know, the paws and all that. The, the padding underneath. I'll go ahead and get that with dark brown while I'm at it. When we gloss it, I gloss the fingernails. 
the nose, the eyes. Just trying to give you a rundown of everything before we do it. Through the thin line goes up the middle of the nose. And this is my dark brown. Yeah, you want to go up so far and then taper out. Good enough. Inside of here gets dark brown. And I'm using my reference picture. Now you can trace all this. What I mean is Don't worry about over spray on the eyes. We'll paint right over that epoxy spill to put on there. And you can't even tell it. You can see basically what I'm doing. I'm just painting over everything that is gray. Quite a lot messier because I'm trying to do it where you can see. This says wearing a camera on my hat. It could work. One eye is like solid black, sorry. Toning the nose down with my dark brown. Not too much. the ears might as well do that now just the very outer extremity because there's a like a, a tuft of rich brown thin hair right there so I'm just I'm just grabbing the very edge Just enough where I can see grass. There we are. Do it on this one. The very edge. Uh, you can see it. That's about it. It's kind of like what you do on a deer. It's actually the same thing you do on a deer. Just grab that very outer edge of that ear. So 
Oh, that is? And then you get down inside the ear a little bit. Maybe come out just a little. Just a little bit. Kind of hard to mess them up, really, because they, uh, they differ. They differ anyway. Trying to do this where you can see it. Remember that thin black line? Now's the time to take care of it. Start at the nose. Go all the way to the inside corner of the mouth. Let's see, where's it at? Well, I think it's right up here. You need to go up here then. Well, it all comes off of the Q-tip microphone. And then you do the same thing to the other side. Sometimes it's better just to get real close. Even these little things that come down right here, you can pin them in. You know, if you want to, or just leave them be. Might be better. Remember, it all comes off with the Q-tip lacquer thinner, if need be. These are the only paws that show. You know, one of them's on the on the wood, but you know the drill. You guessed it. Try to focus on the padding and nothing else. Every toe has its own padding. Make sure you get all the padding everywhere. Now we just clean the eyes off and the glossy. Put this guy right above his nose. I want this thing as relatively thin to look right. And that's looking pretty good. There we are. We okay, got that taken care of. Now, let's clean this eye off. To be safe, I'm just going to get the middle of it with a Q-tip. And then the rest of it is going to be tedious with an X-Acto knife. Yeah, I had some paint on my whiskers and had a little paint on the side of this Bob cat, I just used a napkin on that. Now to get the paint off, you just do like you do a deer. I'm blow it off every now and then, but I'm gonna get to you can do it fast. Because it's a small either. You're you're not talking about a lot. But you just keep working it. Close to the edge as you can without you don't want to Scrape any of your paint, you know, surrounding the eye. Okay, now we just gloss it real good. Oh yeah, that's real good. Down through here, yeah.
He's got claws. Go ahead and throw some gloss on his claws. Well, here's what I kind of got. Uh, doesn't look too bad. He's going to look better when he's blow dried. His ears look long because the hair's not fluffed out. So, uh, I'm happy with it. Now we just fluff him up real good. Well, here's kind of what we come up with. Uh, now we're going to put a little bit of habitat material. I just got a little ivy. Get a little glue and stick it up in there and make sure it don't go nowhere. Moss, literally from out in the yard, you know, that just is regular moss growing out in the yard. Grows on the side of trees. Old fence posts are good places to find it. Elmer's glue is probably better for sticking in the long run. It'll it'll glue to all these little roots plus the dirt. You don't have to worry about getting burned either. So it's actually better than this if you've got any on hand. Now a lot of times I'll put it like at the corner of a base. Like right there. That's a good spot for it, right there. And you can cover a lot of a lot of stuff up with this stuff. Now one thing about that moss, eventually it'll turn yellow. But it'll still look good. It'll just be you know yellow. Well, this is how I'm mounting a bobcat.